The high stakes meeting in San Francisco has come to an end. U.S. President Joe Biden welcomed Chinese President Xi Jinping at the Filoli estate. The two sat down and talked for about four hours. But what followed was a sour ending, to say the least. President Joe Biden called Xi Jinping a dictator. That's right. That's what he called the Chinese leader after meeting him. You have to listen to this. And Mr. President, after today, would you still refer to President Xi as a dictator? This is a term uh, that we used earlier this year. Well, look, he is. I mean, he's a dictator in the sense that he, he is a guy who runs a country that is a communist country that is based on a foreign government totally different than ours. Just when we thought bromance was brewing between Biden and Xi, the American president went ahead and called him a dictator once again. And by doing that, Biden has attracted criticism from China, of course. Listen now to what the Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson had to say. This kind of statement is extremely incorrect and irresponsible political manipulation, which China resolutely opposes. It needs to be pointed out that there are always some ill-intentioned individuals attempting to sow discord and damage U.S.-China relations, but their attempts will not succeed. And despite this, both the sides have portrayed the meeting as largely successful. President Biden says it was one of the most constructive and productive discussions that the leaders have ever had. Xi Jinping came to the U.S. seeking respect, and he got exactly that. President Biden struck a warm, welcoming tone. The two were seen strolling through a garden and chatting away. From what analysts say, Xi Jinping wants to be seen as Biden's equal. In fact, he called the U.S.-China relationship the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Listen in. Last time we met in Bali, you said it was a year and a day ago. A lot has happened since then. The China-U.S. relationship, which is the most important bilateral relationship in the world, should be perceived and envisioned in a broad context of the accelerating global transformations unseen in a century. Mr. President, you and I, we are at the helm of China-U.S. relations. We shoulder heavy responsibilities for the two peoples, for the world, and for history. So for all this talking, what exactly came out of the meeting? As the U.S. intended, it has managed to restore military-to-military -military communication with China. The U.S. and China will open a presidential hotline. President Biden saying he and Xi Jinping have agreed to pick up the phone and talk during periods of disagreement. One of the sticking points between Xi and Biden was Taiwan, of course. Xi Jinping himself acknowledged that Taiwan is the biggest most dangerous issue in U.S.-China ties. Biden stressed on peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, while Xi Jinping assured Biden that China had no plans for military action against Taiwan for the coming years at least. He also hinted at certain conditions when force could be used. The two leaders also discussed the increasing menace of fentanyl. They have agreed to work together and curb its production. China has pledged to target companies involved with fentanyl and the U.S. plans to monitor these efforts. And other than that, she and Biden talked about West Asia. What's happening in Israel? Biden also sought China's help to de-escalate the tensions with Iran, to which the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi confirmed talks with Iran were ongoing. As the American and Chinese leaders sat and talked, we made a rather interesting observation. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, appeared particularly tense while President Biden talked. Blinken looked visibly stressed. It almost seemed nervous. Of, uh, he al almost seemed nervous of President Biden making an off-putting remark. And after the meeting, Xi Jinping dined with American business leaders. There he said, and I'm quoting, the door of China-U.S. relations cannot be closed again now that it's open. We need to build more bridges and pave more roads between each other. Needless to say, the dinner was lavish, with each plate costing some $2,000. It was organized by two American firms that do business with China, but they are now being blasted by some U.S. house lawmakers. Why is that? Because the company sold tickets to business tycoons to attend this feast. 
So how much does a dinner with Xi Jinping cost? No less than $40,000, roughly the price of a new car. With that amount, American businessmen were able to get direct access to the Chinese president. It is day 40 of the Israel-Hamas war. In these 40 days, we've seen Palestinians leaving their homes, Israeli troops entrenching themselves further into the Gaza Strip, and a bitter war of words on who's right and who's not. And now, there are calls for the Prime Minister of Israel to resign. Yes, after 40 days of this grinding war, Netanyahu is facing calls to go, both from the country's opposition and the people of Israel. Let's start off with a statement made by Yair Lapid, the former Prime Minister of Israel and now the leader of the opposition. He has called upon Netanyahu to leave to step down from the Prime Minister's post. That appeal was made earlier today in an interview to Israel's Channel 12. During the interview, Lapid accused Netanyahu of poorly handling this war, almost insinuating that he was deliberately belonging it. Let me just quote his exact remark. Netanyahu needs to go now during the fighting. We will sit in government under another candidate from the Likud. There are many people there who understand the country is going to a bad place. We cannot allow ourselves to conduct a prolonged campaign with a prime minister that the public has no faith in. I want to stress on that last line, a prime minister that the public has no faith in. Now, how can Yair Lapid be so sure about that? Does he have evidence to back that claim? Do Israelis really want Netanyahu to go? Now, it helps to look at some surveys, the numbers. Take this one, for instance. It was conducted by Israel's Channel 12 just last week. And the findings say majority of the Israelis want Netanyahu to resign. What does this majority comprise of? At least 76% of those surveyed, they all want Netanyahu to go, 76% of them. Meanwhile, 64% others believing that an election should be held immediately after the war. So clearly, Lapid's suggestion does have takers. But what explains this is the immediate question. Well, anti-Netanyahu sentiment, sentiment has been prevalent in Israel for quite some time now, even before the war started. There were demonstrations against his proposed judicial overhaul. Almost every month, there were thousands of Israelis, remember, marching on the streets, asking Netanyahu to reconsider his contentious plan. And then the war happened, and the protests subsided. But 40 days into the war, the protesters are back, and this time they are demonstrating against Netanyahu's failure in getting the hostages back. Just have a look at these visuals. They are from Tel Aviv. On Wednesday, family members of hostages taken by Hamas gathered in the heart of the city. They chanted slogans against the government, slamming it for failing to get the hostages released, accusing it of failing to perform its duties. Listen in. We came to tell the government uh, and the Minister of Defense that we want the, our loving families back home now. We don't have time to wait. Ohad is nine years old. He just turned nine on the 23rd of October. I don't want him to be back on his bar mitzvah when he'll be 13. We want them now. Tonight we are trying to tell the Israeli government that enough is enough. All, uh, already 40 days uh, uh, went by and I have three grandchildren and the daughter-in-law there in Gaza. One of my grandchildren is four years old. He doesn't know Hamas, he doesn't know time, he doesn't know nothing. The authority which is responsible for my family being captured in Gaza is the Israeli government. Any government in the world is supposed to protect its citizens. The Israeli government didn't do its duty. Therefore, it's the responsibility of the Israeli government to bring them back. Now, these statements are a testimony of the growing anti-Netanyahu sentiment. That sentiment, in fact, is growing by the hour. But the thing is, will it be wise for a leader to step down in the middle of a war? If yes, 
how do Israeli leaders and the people expect this transition to really take place? I mean, electing a new leader is no piece of cake. The process is time consuming. Do they expect decision making for the war to be kept on the back burner during that process? How would that work out? Here's what Yar Lapid has suggested. He says that he is ready to create a quote unquote national reconstruction government. He says this government should be led by the Likud along with ultra orthodox parties. Avigdor Liberman's Yisrael Betenu and Benny Gantz's national unity. His only condition is that Netanyahu should not lead it, that the Likud party should replace him with someone else. Now, has this suggestion found any takers? Not yet. In fact, Netanyahu's party has slammed Lapid's remarks, accusing him of seeking to establish a government that would pursue the Palestinian cause. Here's what it said. I'm quoting. It is unfortunate and shameful that Lapid is playing politics during a war when he suggests ousting the prime minister who leads the campaign and replacing him with a government that will establish a Palestinian state and allow the Palestinian Authority to control Gaza. So on day 40 of the war, this is what we have. The IDF getting deeper into the Gaza Strip, Hamas playing a game of hide-and-seek in the tunnels, and growing anti-Netanyahu sentiment across Israel. The coming days are crucial to say the least. They will determine the fate of this war, also the fate of Netanyahu. In a groundbreaking discovery, scientists unearthed a mind-bending supernova explosion billions of light years away. On October 9, telescopes caught a glimpse of high energy of photons hurtling towards planet Earth, a chilling sign of an explosion 1.9 billion light years distant. Watch our next report to know more about what supernovas are all about and how they can be dangerous. Supernovas are cosmic nightmares, one of the most destructive forces in the universe, capable of obliterating entire biospheres and even destroying planets with lethal radiation. So what really are supernovas? When giant stars die in massive explosions called supernovas, they temporarily become some of the most brightest objects in the universe. A single supernova can outshine the combined light of hundreds of billions of stars. But when they explode, they send extremely powerful energetic radiation and blast waves of ejected gas far into space. These cosmic detonations occur as massive stars exhaust their atomic fuel and collapse under their own weight. They culminate in a breathtaking thermonuclear explosion witnessing the outer layers being violently ejected into the abyss of space. A supernova detonating within a mere 25 light years of Earth can trigger the nightmarish scenario of our atmosphere vanishing, condemning all life to a silent, airless extinction. If the supernova is a little further away from the cosmic scale, the radiation can annihilate a planet's ozone layer casting a lengthening shadow on its fate for years after the initial blast. Scientists found evidence that a supernova explosion billions of light years away was so powerful that it temporarily destroyed some of the Earth's ozone layer in 2022. While the likelihood of such a cataclysmic scenario is slim, but the incident of last year shows that our planet is at the mercy of celestial chaos.